So what I'll do, you know, all these evidence are there, everybody knows, you know, for the hundred years, so many scientists have contributed. And this is really their work, I'm just putting it together, and there are many few gaps which I fill it up to make a sort of continuous story. Okay? So all this origin of life, if you really see in a sort of hierarchical way, it's only simple source. One is the cosmic, the second one is the geologic, third one is the chemical, and fourth one is the biological. So what happens through time, more and more complex molecules are eventually saving all. Okay. The cosmic second name really says everything. Cosmic means this is really the import of the biomolecules from space, which Carl Sagan, you know, sort of said many, many times. The geologic is very interesting. This is sort of fairly new, and uh, I'm also involved. That is, you need a place. You know, you can bring all the ingredients from the grocery. Now, you need a kitchen. And that kitchen was provided by Mother Earth. What is that kitchen? Is it all gone? Because unlike any other planet, our planet is dynamic. All the time, crust is recycled because of plate tectonics. So most of the old evidence are gone. So is there any remnant? Is there any relic? Yes. I think there is a relic. And we can look at these things and see whether we can build that kitchen. And it is there. This is where the geology will play a very important role. Because this is why this life encouraging, you know, cooking would be gone for millions of years. Finally, there will be sort of very important chemical stage where the simple biomolecules which came from space they will be synthesized, they will be polymerized, they will become more and more complex molecules. And finally, the most important thing would be the biological stage when one cell splits into two. That is probably the most important event in our whole solar system. That is the replication, the beginning of life. Okay? So let's follow this in you know, four stages. Because I've already given you know, the now think about how lucky we are. We are born, our blue planet was born with astronomical luck. And this is what Steve will call, you know, historical contingency. If it didn't happen, if our planet did not occupy it as a third position, there'll be no life. If it did not have this the same size, there would be no life. We are fortunate that our planet was really the right distance from the sun, so can it can hold water in a liquid form. Mind you, this is the first requirement. Water should be there in liquid form, not in ice. And so this is why now NASA has found this kind, these are called Goldilocks, because of this story, you all know it is not too hot, not too cold, just the light. And at least, you know, 300 planets have been detected by NASA while the life possibility is very, very high. And also, think about, we have all these six important elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. It came from a probably belly of a dying star, you know. So we are all basically stardust. If there is no supernova explosions, we will not be here. See, again, these are the contingency. One event after another. <coughs> so, in cosmic state, we can really, basically, there are two simple things. One is that, you know, these biomolecules, they came from space. This is the exogenous delivery. And then it was cooked in our planet, which is this endogenous synthesis. Now, I'll talk about these things. Today our planet looks so placid, so beautiful, so green. That was not so. Beginning it was really harsh, inhospitable, and traumatic. Okay? So these two, you can see this cosmic stage, that is exogenous delivery of this, mainly by comets and asteroids. And then here, this is our you know, kitchen. 
So let's look, because you know, we have to consider the very first history of our planet, the beginning of the beginning. Unfortunately, that period is called Hegelian, let me say, and it is missing. That chapter is gone because of the recycling of this. And it was sort of hot, molten. And think about day in, day and day out, these meteorites, asteroids, and comets, they are crashing. So it was, you know, if we could go back in time and look at our planet, it's not a blue planet. It would be just like a hot ball, okay? This sort of lava, molten. And about just about 30 million years after the birth of our planet, there's a Mars-sized meteorite crashed on our planet. And this is how the moon was born. Think about another contingency. If there was no moon, that impact was so tremendous, our planet tilted 23 degrees. And that gives all the weather. You get spring, you get winter, you get summer, you know. All the biodegrades, all the tides. If there is no moon, there will be no biodegrades. There will be no day and night. I mean, so all these things, you know, it just happened. And yet it was random. You know, there was no goal. It just happened. But this one event led to the other. So this is the beginning. From 4.6 to 4 billion years, it was just you know, it, um, a very, very, you know, meteorite bombardment. How do you know? It's very easy. Look at our neighbor, which are the dead. Look at moon, look at mercury. The only geologic features you will see these crater rings. Because that's the time they were alive and they died. There's no ocean, no plate tectonics, nothing. They beautifully preserved all the early history. And although our missing album, we can reconstruct from this, you know, Mercury moon. So this is exactly how our planet would look like, say about four billion years, or maybe four point one billion years ago. Only feature is yes. Before we leave the slide, what is that sort of radiating pattern for Mercury? Very good. So these are all, you know, this what happened? There is a very large impact. So these are either lava flow going on, okay? Or sometimes this ejector, they're going on in radio pressure. So there is a series of, you know, for example, if you look at some of these crater, it could be 1,000 miles, huge. You know, this rim looks very insignificant. It may be 10, 15 miles high. And most of these are lava field. Impact was so tremendous, they melted the rock. So these are the lava lake. You heard about lunar maria. This is really nothing but lava lake. Yes? So, uh, if, if the moon yeah. sort of rose from the Earth, as you suggest that we think, then how come life didn't arise, or how come we haven't discovered life as we know it here on the moon? On the moon? Yeah. Moon is, there is nothing. There is no life sustaining. You know, what is there on the moon? There is no oxygen, there is no water. Of course, now they are finding little water on the two poles. Oh, but, he, he, okay. Very good. You were so, what happened at that time, Earth was also sterile. There's no life. It happened just after Earth was formed. 4.6 billion years ago, Earth was formed. Moon formed about 4.5 you know, billion years ago. Still, our planet was just like that. Okay? So, it was just like a sort of clone. In fact, lunar rocks and earth rocks, <coughs> very similar, okay? So since our planet was sterile at that time, moon is also sterile. And this is the beauty of our planet. It evolves, and they are dead. So this is the chronology, you know, six stages, okay? But I'm going to talk about all these things. Basically, we have to know this two, only two parts, okay? So moon has been formed, to answer your questions. Still there is no life. Still the bombardment going on, going on. And then about four billion years ago, something happened. Cooled down. How do you know? I'll come to the point. But this cosmic stage, these the comets and the meteorites, 
Okay, comets you cannot catch. But meteorites, yes. You know, these are the poor man's space instrument. And there is a meteorite called Murchison meteorite, which fell in Australia. It gives so much clue about the origin of life, I'll come to that point. Similarly, this comet held off, you know, when it was passing through, they were able to synthesize and they were surprised to find almost all of the building block of life. So, look at this Murchison meteorite, okay? It's sort of, again, carbon-rich meteorite. And they were able to find amino acids, all nucleotide bases. If you want to make this RNA DNA, the basic building blocks are there. And I'll show you that Dimar, what he did, he sort of, you know, grounded these things and put it in water. Suddenly the membrane is coming out, this lipid membrane. So they really tried to, probably in space, they tried to make life. They did not, you know, finish that thing. But almost all of the ingredients of life, they are present, both in asteroid and in comets. So this is that Dimas beautiful experiment. You can see how these cell-like structures, they are forming and they are dividing. They all came from this Murchison meteorite. Same composition except, you know, this membrane doesn't have any protein and we'll talk about these things. So, now it becomes, you know, there is no magic. Whole space, whole interstellar space is full of these organic molecules. We don't have to do it here. It's already there in the supermarket. Just buy it. And this is exactly what happened in the beginning that these comets and meteorites are bringing. You know, to your doorstep, day in, day out. If we could go back four billion years ago, it would be very dramatic. Almost whole sky, it would be you know, filled with moon. Suddenly, Robert went stopped. It was now a watery planet, from pole to pole water, how do you know? Again, this is a mineral called zircon, which can only be formed when there is enough water. So no doubt by four billion years ago, uh, you know, our planet became almost like to this planet, except no life. But water was there. Water in liquid form, which is one of the requirement. Now, we need a place. This is one of the things that where the life was cooked. If you read any textbook, they say that in this, you know, in this oceans, life, you know, uh, forming process started. But that's not a very logical thing. Why not? Because it's a huge. In fact, our ocean at that time was 90%, more larger than today's ocean, 75%. You cannot cook anything there. It will be just diluted. You need a sort of sequestered, you need a sort of very protected, small area where these biomolecules could be concentrated. You need this concentration. You need a separate place. And again, look at this. This is exactly how our planet would look like. So why don't you take any of these craters? That would be the ideal place to start the synthesis of life. Because that was there, we know, from Moon and Mercury. And we know what happened when there's a big crater. That is, inside it will be lava field. This is, we need that heat. So this is probably where it started, you know, in a big crater. So this is, think about, if you want to visualize how our planet would look like, think, look at the Moon's surface, close your eyes, and think it is filled up by water. That's all. Exactly this is how the young Earth would look like. And mind you, these craterions could be 20, 30 miles high. So in other words, whatever is concentrated, it will be there. And inside the crater, what you'll see? You'll see the lava is coming out. There is a hydrothermal vent. Now, look, there are only three places see, on Earth but this oldest form of rocks, especially, you need a sedimentary rock uh, preserved. One is Australia, you know, uh, Greenland. 
One is uh, in <coughs> Africa, called Kabul Crater. One is in Pilbara, Australia. This is where at least 3.5 million years to almost 4 million years, you know, old sedimentary rocks have been found, and also the very sign of life, earliest life, okay? This microfossils. So, we know this is where at least the oldest lives are there. If we can reconstruct, these are called greenstone belts simply because it has a greenish color, there is a mineral called chloride. But if you look at this architecture, they really look like a complex crater. Mind you, at that time there is no continent. Okay? So the only geomorphology in our planet was just crater basins. So these three craters which I think this greenstone belt, this is how the modern greenstone belt would look like. This is exactly the same of a complex crater, except if you just, you know, erode that part, okay? And also in this, all these three areas, you find the evidence of impact. You find spherules, you find iridium, that indicates, you know, they're really formed by impact structure. So this is a brand new idea that yes, now we can pinpoint the actual crucible of life. This is not open ocean. It's a very restricted crater basin. And with this hydrothermal vent in place, because we need that energy, heat energy. And life started in the dark, you know, chamber. So these are the fossils that have been found from Australia and also from South Africa. These are the oldest life and they are very close to thermophiles or heat loving bacteria. So you see the present day evidence and the fossil evidence, they match. If you look at their surroundings, the rocks, this is exactly the form in that hydrothermal vent community. Okay? So these are all heat loving bacteria. So this is what happens. If you just go today, under the oceans, you see these black smokers, okay? So these black smokers, they contain, you know, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, sulfur, and these bacteria are chemosynthetic. That means they are getting energy from this, you know, chem chemistry. So what happens? Okay. This gentleman, David Dumer, so he was one of the pioneers in this whole origin of life debate. And he said, that before we do anything, we need a continent. We need a sort of cell membrane. And mind you, cell membrane is the most easy to form. And in this talk, I'll use a very simple philosophy called, you know, parsimony. That means you take the simplest route. Nature will always opt for the simplest route. And you see, David Dimmer. Because if you just cross this Marchese meteorite, you create these things. You create this membrane. You don't have to do anything. So this is the most easy to form. So in this whole debate, which came first, you know, it seems demand is right, that yes, we, we need a crucible. So first, we need two kinds of protection. One. We need a protected basin to form the synthesis. Then, within the cell, we need this outer envelope. Otherwise, you know, complex, you know, reaction between the protein and nucleic acid could not take place. So, look at this. So, this is the environment within the crater. This is how it will look like. So, this is the hydrothermal vein. Basically, it's a typical volcano. There are lots of cracks. So water is seeping, and all these chemicals, they are coming. But I want you to point out these things. As you go away from the crest, you see these sediments. Okay? These sediments, these are mainly clay and pyrite. They will play the most important role in the synthesis of life. Okay? And look at this interface. Whenever you have this different interface, for example, sorry, this is the air, water, okay, water, solid. And that, why most of the reaction really takes place whenever you find. And also this heat, 
And what is happening? There is that typical convection current. This is exactly, think about how to cook. You take a pot, you put some ingredients and you heat it. Why you heat it? Because of this convection current. Exactly the same thing happens in this crucible. So all the time this, you know, current, they're taking this upper layer to the bottom and the bottom layer to the up and all the time it's sort of churning and moving and they're sort of concentrating. It's an ideal idea. Think about it, it's a big pot. Okay, Mother Nature is cooking the very first one. And you can see, so although, they now you can see the mechanism. So the top part would be almost like a oil slick, it's sort of dark. Okay? But these, although they're lighter, these lipid membranes, they'll come down, and once they come down and meet to the sediments, they'll stick it. Although they're light, you know, so this is sort of very sticking surface. This is very important. This is a crucial stage for encapsulation. And of course we know that membrane, you know, they have sort of uh, one end is sort of the lava water, the other is head. And initially they had the, you know, all the cell we see today, sort of double membrane. But uh, these thermophiles, you know, they have sort of single type of membrane. And you can see these are sort of lipid molecules. Now here these proteins are coming and I'll explain why it is so important. Okay, so basically these are the bubbles maybe left, you know, dumped by these comets and all these things. So what is happening here in this hydrothermal vent, they're simply concentrated, recycled, they're taking, you know, all kinds of nutrients. So once we want to understand, you know, what is life, it has to be sort of very simple, otherwise it's, it will be complex. Okay, basically we can say that there are the three components of life, that is, one is the cell membrane, outer, and then of course the proteins and the nucleic acid. So if we know how these three things could be produced in this geological environment, in the crater basins, then we are very close to produce life. Okay? And it's a sort of very interesting called you know, emergent phenomenon. That is, it's not a single event. It took many, many millions of years and see how we can do it. So, we have discussed the cosmic stage, we have discussed the geologic stage, but the cooking is going on. So basically, they are cooking mainly two things. One, which are dumped by this mainly comets, and also there is a heat, there is a water, and there is that mineral substrate. That's the most important thing. And then in the chemical stage, still in the hydrothermal vent community, in the crater basin, two important steps took place. One is this chirality. You know, we all life we see today <coughs> in our planet, whether it's a bacteria or whether it's a human being, we have a sort of unique birthmark. That is, mind you, in nature, amino acids, like Miller experiments, you can produce, whenever you produce amino acids, it will be 50% left handed, 50% right handed. But in life, only the 50% and only the left-handed amino acids are selected. You will never find any life with right-handed amino acids. Similarly, the sugar, which is a very important component of you know, nucleic acid, all the sugar, they are all right-handed. So in fact, you know, if they find any life on Mars, the very first thing they will do, just to check, whether they have this left-handed amino acids and right-handed. If they find the opposite, then they will claim these are you know, entirely two different sets of evolutions. It's so important. So one of the things happened, these chiral molecules, that is this handedness was selected. It's a all life, you know. And the second, of course, which all the time chemist does, that is polymerization, but in this vein community, there are two important, you know, minerals, which are just ideal for, you know, polymerization. So you have this, you know, like think about it. If you want to build this building, what you do? You take brick, you join it together, you make a brick house. Similarly, in chemistry, all the time, they take this, you know, simple building block of life, or monomer, they simply join, they make a polymer. So both protein 
and the nucleic acid, they are just in a weak polymer. And this, how to make this weak polymer, you know, because all these bases are there, nuclei, nucleotide bases and the amino acids, they are already there, you know, they are sort of cooking there, and they are sort of joined. So these two important steps took place in the hydrothermal brain, and that's a major, major step in the chemical stage, okay? So hand and dice means, you can see this in nature, you know, organic molecules, they come in this, you know, two forms, left-handed and right-handed, all the time. For example, you know, you take Tylenol, and this pharmaceutical company, all the time, it has been found that if you take left-handed ibuprofen, it has a much, much better healing power than the right-handed. And that's why they separate it, okay? Yes, oh, five more minutes? Okay, so basically that happened. And then, okay, so these minerals, you know, this is, they are the magic. You know, inside the minerals, there's sort of pores and spaces and all these things by which they are the scaffold, by which, you know, they can really make it sort of very nice, you know, complex molecules. And these two minerals really played very important roles. One is the pyrite and other is the clay minerals. So this is how, you know, these simple monomers can join to form a sort of polymers. And I'll simply skip quite a bit. So now we are still in the hydrothermal vein community. We have already created separately. So this is now really the mineral substrate, okay? It may be rich in clay minerals here. It could be rich in pyrite. And this is where probably this, you know, very fast nucleic acids like RNA, they are forming. This is where these proteins are forming. Now look how this membrane can be encapsulated. Because if they come to the surface, they are like a half membrane. This is where, and mind you, in these port spaces, all these, you know, RNA and proteins, they are sort of concentrating. And by randomly, okay? They are sort of enclosing, and it must have gone, you know, many, many millions of years, and then there will be sort of natural selections, and eventually two will fuse together, and they want to communicate, okay? The very first sort of genetic code or translation, you know, started, that is this, you know, RNA is beginning to communicate with the protein, and then we see this, you know, how they are doing it, and this end of, you know, pair basis. And of course, I'll quickly skip it because everybody knows Lin's contribution to this, you know, <laughs> in the symbiotic theory, how the eukaryotic cells, you know, formed. So using the same idea, we can do it in the molecular level, okay? So, and it has sort of exactly like what Lin, you know, thought serial in endosymbiosis. We can do the same thing here. So this is this mineral substrate. You can see that, you know, RNA is sort of enclosing within the, so this enclosure is very important. Similarly here, the protein is enclosed, and then the first level of, you know, endopyobis started, this protein is contributing a little to this membrane, which is mainly this, you know, fatty membrane, and uh, we are getting this, you know, for the fast and plasma membrane, which is much more durable, stable. And then these two, they'll simply, you know, join, and so there is, you know, they will start beginning to communicate. The first very primitive genetic code or translation sort of started, and then probably this retrovirus would form, eventually, you know, DNA. So this, this division of this cell, as I said, this is probably the most, most important event in our planet, you know. So again, you can see this whole scenario again, you know, I'm repeating that this is the niche of the nucleic and the protein. They're set up randomly, you know, they'll join, and out of this maybe millions of years, you know, they'll be selected, which, you know, they can sort of communicate, they can... Uh, so what would happen in few generations, this older RNA and older protein, they'll be entirely neglected, and this would be all custom-made, okay? This RNA would make its own protein, and this will go on eventually, you'll create the DNA and this fast you know, division of the cell would form. That brings another very important question. That these cellular particles, are 
Are they still present today? Now look at in the physical world, what happens before it, just after the Big Bang. You know, all these atomic particles, that's the electron, proton, neutron, they are in a sort of charge stage. Through time, they'll combine, they'll form the atom. Similarly, you know, today's virus is really nothing, but it's just a piece of DNA. And this prion, this is really, you know, piece of um, protein. And the molecular biologists have found that they predate the origin of the first cell. In other words, they are the remnants and relics of the very important components of life. They're still around us. Today they're all parasites. But initially when they're forming, they're really the virus and prions. Okay? And just like this, you know, proton and electrons to make a, you know, so they are there, except we never bother to look at it. We don't, they are always there. They have been with us. Exactly. What he did, he actually made an artificial DNA. And he took this mycoplasma, one of these very, you know, simplest organisms, and put it there, and the cell tries to divide. Of course, he had the resources, maybe 50 people worked for 10 years, but he was able to do this. This is exactly, you know, this theory has a heuristic value. In other words, if I'm right, and, you know, both virus and prions are there, you know, you can put it in an empty cell and see, you have to do lots of experiments whether you can create the very first life. Thank you so much.